All right. Well, I think well, it's about time to get going, so we stay on time. So um, I just hit record. So this is our first trial at our uh, sort of take on an ESRM salon, as John as John phrased it. Um, and so uh, we're just trying this thing out. Uh, had a lot of thoughts that it was going to start about a month or so ago, but various people couldn't make various things. So screw that. We're starting with the best. We're starting with John Lambrinos, the great Dr. John Lambrinos. And um, so our rough plan is we're just going to go to six. We're not going to go for hours and hours as much as we would love to talk to each other. Um, recording this so people miss it, they can, they can watch it after the fact. So John and I had some witty banter about uh, a couple of days ago, and I recorded that. So there's about 20 minutes of us just talking and so that's sort of to get us going, get us sort of get the juices flowing and that's going to end. And then the floor is just open. So anybody can ask a question. Anybody can ask uh, anything. Obviously, obviously, today we're focusing a bit on invasives, but that's where we're starting. You can you, everybody's welcome to talk about whatever the heck they want. So you should grab your libations or your snacks or whatever it is. And we're going to get going. And so I'm going to uh, hit play in a second and we'll, we'll go and then and then. Folks can chime in uh, after that first 20 minutes or so. Sound good? You want to give people a few minutes and some people are just joining us or do you want to? Uh, well, I mean, I think we, we could so we could do witty banter for a minute or two before we start, but mm -hmm. uh, sure. Did you, what, did you get the history of the do drop in? I mean, I know yeah. you sent the around history online, do, I'll, I'll actually but... toss it in the chat. I'll toss it in the chat. So the history... Yeah. Oh, wait, it didn't didn't toss in there. I thought I just tossed it in. And maybe, maybe you and... Uh, Especially John should introduce yourselves because not everybody knows. It, I mean, I yeah, know no, no. In the, in the uh, we have that at the start. For some reason, I okay. can't. All right, taste. all right. I'm just kind of I'm vamping. I'm trying to like trying to let let the people get settled. Like, I'm, right, I'm, right, a, I'm right, afraid yeah. of this uh, of this video because it seems like witty banter should be something you shouldn't revisit. Seems yes. like it has a. <laughs> oh, but it's, it's going to be. Am I it's such think that you bite something when you're really drunk one night and then you, 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 you wake up and you get the next day? So, for reasons I, I can't know. explain, I cannot paste anything in the chat at the moment. I don't understand why, since I'm actually supposedly running the meeting. Why don't you text it to me and I'll paste it? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, the short version is though the do drop in is this was this really cool place. I guess it still technically exists in New Orleans in sort of mid city area. And it was called the Do Drop In, you know, D-E-W drop I-N-N. -N, and it was uh, started in the thirties. And it was a place for, uh, owned by African-American folks. And it was a place where folks that were traveling through the South, if you wanted a safe place to, mm -hmm. to catch a meal and sleep and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it very quickly, so there, there was a, a staying there, a, a motel, you know, hotel type of thing. But then there's also food and a barber shop and a beauty shop and all this kind of stuff. And so, but it really got popular was the nightlife. So it was a place where there were a cross dressers, there were a black folks, white folks, rich folks, poor folks. Uh, uh, people that would dance all night and it, and it became known as a fantastic place, not only for local musicians, but where folks that were traveling through the area or the town would, would just encamp for weeks on end. They would do shows after shows after shows. And so um, it was just a really great example of folks just coming together and having fun, everybody from all walks of life and all backgrounds and no judgments and just sort of pop on in and have a great time. So we're, we're trying to figure out, when I was trying to figure out a name for this, I thought the do drop in was was a cool uh, model to follow. So it, unfortunately, it, it it hung around for a long time. It hung around to the 1970s and then still existed, but kind of you know fell on uh, hard times, as it were. And then Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, really nuked it, and so it so it was still ex in existence, but it was all you know physically damaged and rotted. And there was a couple attempts to to resurrect it, to to restore the buildings, and they all fell through. And so basically, it's it's uh, no longer no longer a thing um Sounds the, like the a building still exists for our next research station it'll be a fantastic research station i love that all right so um i mean nothing so there we go so so again if you guys just joined us uh real quick we're gonna play uh john and i spoke for a little bit uh, uh a couple days ago as an entry it's about 20 minutes of just talking and back and forth when that ends it's open to anybody anybody can ask any questions we're starting off talking about invasive species, but you guys can talk about whatever you want. And so with that, I'm gonna kick us, I'm gonna kick us off 
with our our uh, incredible witty banter. Uh, all right, you guys. So welcome. Uh, today we have the great Dr. John Lambrinos from Oregon State University, who is uh, joining us uh, from the from the vast northern, wet, moist, cold area of Oregon. Is it cold in Oregon today, John? It is. It was. Uh, it was cold yesterday, and then uh, it's raining today. So usually, when it rains, it warms up. Well, warming up meaning I think it's like uh, probably like fifty degrees, maybe forty-eight degrees, and raining. <laughs> That's relatively <laughs> during the winter. It, it's it's classic. It's uh, it's like thirty-three degrees and wet. That's for like chunks of the year. Shit. But it's uh, it's been starting. It's uh, the last two years. I don't know if this is climate change related Ooh. or not, but the the typical date for when it really starts to rain up here is Halloween. That's like kind of the joke that it always pours rain on Halloween. Interesting. Um, but this year and last year, it's been um, it hasn't really started started late. And so it's raining now, but it it's like not a whole lot of rain. Like usually when it starts, you get like a, a full week where it's just like solid pounding rain for like the whole week. And then, oh, like now winter has started. We haven't gotten a storm like that yet. Interesting. It's still waiting. Yeah, so our rule of thumb in California, right, is October 15th when you have to have all your, your sediment control measures in place around your construction sites. Cause it doesn't really start raining then, but it might start vaguely drizzling. So vaguely drizzling is equivalent to downpour in, in Oregon. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you asked before we get going, you asked about my new backdrop, this pirate uh, uh, painting. So this was made by this uh, super cool dude who um, was like uh, Norman Rockwell. He did more Saturday evening posts than uh, Norman Rockwell, I think his name is Enzo, um, but he was basically sort of a, a, spent a lot of his life sort of as an itinerant traveling around artist guy, South America doing all these things. And then, then came to the U S and started doing more, um, uh, commercial illustrations for ads and stuff. And so this, this painting actually got the way. So this was, uh, for sale last year on, uh, on Craigslist. I should have bought it. I didn't, but, um, it's one of the, he made at ultimately like four or five for Walt Disney. And this was from the Pirates of the Caribbean. And this was hung in the Pirates of the Caribbean. Whoa. Yeah. And so it was just at some dude's house. He was selling it. It's a really, it's, it's, it's awesome. How did you not Pirates. buy it? How much did it cost? It was only 5,000 bucks, but yeah. you know, it was, I was, on, I was on my sabbatical <laughs> a, salary. And right. so I didn't, didn't have the 5,000 laying around. That's but enough I mean, to for, give you a little bit of pause. For a piece of history though, it's cheap. So yes. I just did the next best thing, which I took a picture of it and then used it as my Zoom background. So that's kind of like having more people that's are seeing the, it now. That's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so pirates, pirates uh, dispersed things, John Lambrinos. Pirates dispersed all kinds of things. Uh, sometimes treasure, sometimes people, sometimes uh, organisms. So uh, do you have any do you have any interesting pirate related? So so our, this do drop in where we're talking about invasives or at least start off talking about invasives and you are invasive coastal invader king or at least expert. So can you do do we have do you have any good pirate uh, invasive species Ooh. stories? Ooh. No. I can't no, think no, of No them. like Barantonia seed dispersal things or something like that. This is not um, this is not a pirate uh, story exactly but the only thing that comes close is is the mutiny of the bounty you know the mission of the what the mission of the bounty was no tell me uh it was it was to go to tahiti to pick up breadfruit and uh to bring it to uh the the west indies really to serve to basically serve as uh food for the plantations for enslaved people in the west indies so there's a whole kind of broader story of the imperialism and colonialism is directly tied in with moving plants around, moving whole suites of organisms, the whole initially uh, in the 16th and, uh, uh, and the 17th and 18th centuries, botanical gardens were set up basically right. as arms of imperialism. Right. Right. And so uh, that's what the mission of the, of the bounty was. And, um, uh, uh, Captain Bly, they had, they actually had, he had moved out of his 
his office in the back of the ship and they had turned it into a greenhouse nursery so he was really he was, he was in this little teeny like uh like the first mate's quarters and people have speculated that that was one kind of reason that sort of eroded his power because <laughs> he was no longer in his like base of base of command so there's a if you there's a couple there's like a famous picture, uh, or I guess there's a couple of famous paintings of like the moment when, um, you know oh, the oh, the mutinies and he's getting put on the on the he's being cast off on the ship and you can see the breadfruit plants on the on the um, really on the top yeah oh that's a good so the, <laughs> and then the irony is I I find this an irony like after the whole he got you know the whole ordeal of like surviving <laughs> getting back to england going through the whole like trial then he finally gets like i think it was like a two years later he gets on another boat another ship and goes back to tahiti and this time like he, the nothing happens like it takes a month to get to a couple months to take the picks up the breadfruit goes back to the west indies and goes back to england and everything's fine <laughs> timing timing's everything um so I love that story. I, I, I vaguely recall something about that now that you mentioned it, but I, lo I love that you uh, you reinserted that into my memory banks. That's great. So what about um, uh, keeping on that theme of imperialism, right? I mean, so so with things like, so, with, so the era of zoos, the era of the, the great era of the, the first great era of naturalists, right? Natural historians, people studying bugs, right? Darwin had his inordinate fondness for beetles and all that jazz. Um, uh, that, that a lot of our, our current thinking in terms of um, inventorying, in terms of you know, binomial nomenclature, all that kind of stuff sort of comes out of this, this same sort of era that you're talking about, which is a sort of notion of um, trying to project, project order onto the natural world and trying to um, you know, understand it. And some of that understanding meant manipulating it, right? So, so spreading around some invasive, some invasive hybrids or forms of Spartina, salt marsh grass to send around to the different parts of the empire so that those parts of the empire could essentially convert their coastal wetlands to more uplands that would be more productive uses and things of that nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a, there's a great book by Alfred Crosby called Ecological and Imperialism. And probably, I think maybe it's, people are maybe more familiar with uh, Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, where he, he kind of tries to explain why, why Europeans were so successful when they, when they like colonized the Americas, right? Like how could, how could a bunch of like, um, you know, not very well edu educated uh, military guys thousands of miles away from home <laughs> Take conquer, over the, conquer the Aztec empire. Right. Um, but I think, uh, I think a better book, a more interesting book is this book by Alfred Crosby, which came out before Jared Diamond's book, where he sort of explains how, how, uh, you know, part of the success was this whole collectious ecological syndrome, this ecological, Kind of world that Europeans brought with them and some of it is unintentional like the disease aspect mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. a lot of it was very intentional they brought they reconstructed their agrarian systems they reconstructed their wetlands they reconstructed their entire ecology it wasn't just them they brought their entire entire ecology from europe and recreated it in mm -hmm. the new in the new world and now, and he argues that that was a big part of why they were successful, partly because it provided this sort of ecology that was familiar to them, but at the same time, it created an ecology which is completely unfamiliar to the people that they were, they were simultaneously conquering, right? And it was that kind of interaction on top of things like smallpox, right. you know, wiping out a big chunk of your society. That's interesting. I mean, I, th I think of, I, I think of, yeah, like we're talking about the missions in, in California, I think of those as essentially little, you know, um, mesocosms essentially of Europe, right? They brought over the grass, they brought over the, the construction techniques from Spain, they brought over the, the architecture, the religion, the, the everything, even the notion of, of how they subjugate the, um, the native peoples and stuff uh, was, was very much following their paramilitary organization structures and stuff. So um, 
Yeah, that's interesting. I think, I think, uh, yeah. So what's, what's the oldest invasion pro project you've worked on or, or the, or the project that speaks to the oldest history of invasion that you've worked on? Mm. I, I don't, I'm a, I'm a new world guy. So I haven't, I haven't gone back too far. Probably the, the New Orleans stuff is probably the, um, so tell you know, people the, about our New Orleans stuff. So we, um, we work in English churn, which is a little patch of forest, um, sort of right across the Mississippi river from, uh, from New Orleans, a little bit South if without a, a map, it's hard to see the geography, but the river is like, cause the river is making a big I'll, S I'll throw in a picture in this in the recording <laughs> so that people see it. So, so it has, it. it has a lot of, uh, a lot of history, you know, several, uh, Battles of the Civil War, the uh, American Revolution <laughs> were fought right yep. in that area. Key turning points of the, both of those wars were, were there. Um, and uh, It's called English Turn because that's where the English were turned back. Exactly. And uh, so, but it's one of the, it's one of the sort of the, we have a lot of records of that area because there's, you know, the, the Spanish, the French were there much longer than even the U.S. became, you know, became a country. And so there's a lot of records of the ecology of that area. And we've, we went and saw um, old maps and records from the uh, New Orleans collection, um, friend who works at the New Orleans collection. And we saw, you know, I think, I forget what the oldest map was. It was a definitely there. There's things that are where the kind of what it is is kind of sketchy, but it was like it was definitely like late 1500s, early 1600s sort of. You can tell they're tree-like things, maps. right? <laughs> so just kind of that's one where a uh, place where I've actually worked where there's definitely sort of a a, a sense of this mm. place has been here a long time. It's gone through a lot of different changes and the the introductions the species introductions are one aspect of that but of course there's a whole wide range of other other aspects of it as well so as someone that works on invaders and and things that weren't historically in this location that we're looking at let's say um do you have an affection for these 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 scraggly things that come in and take over whole systems do you have a love for invaders? Are you neutral about invaders? Do you like to get into the history? What's tell me how you how you view your frequent subjects in your research? Oh, they're they're they're, they're really cool plants. I mean, it's hard to not get excited and interested about these plants. Many of which are are just really fascinating, interesting plants, and that's so that's one <laughs> that's one aspect of them. Um, but the other kind of interesting aspect of them is, and I think this is a kind of something we often kind of forget about when we're talking about introductions and invasions. It's not simply the plant itself. It's the plant, which as, or, you know, whatever the species is that has been moved in from one context, right? One environment, one situation, one community and placed into some place else. Right. And I thought I, I you can sort of relate it to your yourself. You know, you go off to college, you go from one, you know, you could be the, you know, one person when you're in high school, right? And then you go off to college and now you're in a completely different, you're in a situation, right? You, you're interacting differently, you change, you grow. And the same thing happens with organisms. They, they interact with their surroundings in a different place. And it's, and it's that kind of interaction which is the really fascinating thing to me it's the between the the invasive i study mostly plants invasive plants and the native plants but also the humans that are also an integral mm -hmm. part of this and have been increasingly become an, an integral part of it beyond simply the moving part of it right but also in terms of creating urban wildland interfaces changing fire regimes and um, creating more pollution that sort of stuff right and I think, I think that's, more, that's what fascinates me. I think that's more, I mean, well, obviously we're friends, so we sort of think alike in some way, shape or form. But, you know, when we started our careers out, this kind of talk was not what most, I would say it's fair to say that wasn't how most mainstream academic ecologists would think about stuff, right? They were like, 
they did they studied the the, the biology they studied the nature and and the people aspect was for what the losers did the people who couldn't get a job or what you did if you're tra- justification to get some money or something but it, that you know that wasn't like the real real interesting thing was the the competition or the predation or the whatever aspect that just happened without people around and i think our generation has been much more i mean we love that doing that too that that's that's cool but but I mean, you're in a department of horticulture. I'm in a long name department, environmental science and resource management, right? And, and, and those, the subjects that we choose to work on are, if not exclusively, almost all have a strong human dimension, if not as the primary focus of, of the ecology. So how, how these invaders are getting spread, how we're gonna control these invaders, how we restore this system you know, functioning. Um, you work a lot on food systems, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think, um, and it sort of relates into, um, you know, when when we were both in grad school, I remember I was thinking about uh, one of our friends who was also in grad school, Tom Huggins, um, he wanted to study, he wanted to study orchids, he really liked, liked orchids, he just wanted to study like the kind of how you know, their competition and how they interacted with each other, and he wanted to do this on Nevis, on um, in derelict uh, orange groves, which is in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, and he thought these on- these orange grove situations were good because they all the trees were similar size and they were evenly spaced out and he could get at them, right? And his I remember his advisor going, "Why would you ever? That, that doesn't make any sense. How in how on earth are you ever going to find out what the fundamental how ecology fundamentally works by studying it in some ecosystem that's completely man made, human made, right? Um, that's crazy. Like, what, you want to become a, a citrus agronomist? <laughs> that's like it's like that's a study site for a citrus agronomist. It's not a study site for an a ecologist. Real ecologist. Yeah. Right. And but I think that's sort of like a like a one aspect of this. But I think. More broadly, ecology has finally realized it's, it's taken a while, <laughs> surprisingly, that uh, you know e- ecology can't simply be about f- discovering these fundamental issues in a world that's the ecology, in a world where the ecology of the world is changing so dramatically. Right? Yep. We have to be much more proactive. It's like here's these fundamental issues. Here's basic science that we've discovered. Here's how this relates to. To, to people and management, things like that. And um, so I think the entire discipline has shifted. You know, yeah. it seems, I guess it's getting to be a, a, while, a long time, but it seems like just yesterday, right? Um, <laughs> it's it shifted considerably since when we were in, in grad school. So what do you think it's, how is it going to shift? How, how do you think the, the study of the interaction of organisms and the maintenance of diversity and those things, how do you think that's going to shift in the next 20 years or so maybe some of our students here are interested in going to grad school maybe they go to grad school maybe they get a job and you know 10 15 years what do you think do you think things will be uh, more or less like they are now in terms of in terms of the approach to to conservation and environmental questions or do you think it's going to continue to evolve and, and change in some deep ways that was a deep question I just asked. I know. Wow. Ooh, I don't know. Well, I don't have a beer I mean, or anything. I need to have a beer. <laughs> I mean, part of me thinks that it's going to become. Um, yeah, I mean, this may sound kind of pessimistic, perhaps. The <laughs> it's going to become much more. Uh, I don't. Utilitarian might be one way of saying it. Where you know, where where we where it, or ecology is responding to very specific problems right yeah. we yeah. have issues we have you know how are we going to keep how are we going to have um keep people's houses from burning down in this yeah. new fire regime that we have in in california right how do we fix that problem right and ecology is in in, in part of that so i think a lot of ecology is going to be less about you know here's understanding how how Ceanothus responds to different fire and more about more kind of real practical things. Like we need to solve how we're going to have people living in California, given this new fire regime. Right. Do you think that'll be, I, I think you're, you're right on that. Do you think that'll be ecology or is it going to spin up into some new sub-discipline or new discipline that, 
you know, in the engineering department or something like that? Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good question. Cause I think, you know, I've, you know, all these problems and issues are inherently interdisciplinary, yeah. right. Or, yeah. and it's a bad word because they're kind of interdisciplinary <laughs> in the context of the disciplines that we have now, <laughs> right? And so you look at uh, like my, like you look at any sort of, it may be different at your, at your uh, school because it's, it's younger, but you get the departments and how things are organized at OSU. It was, it, it looks like the organization from uh, two centuries ago, <laughs> right? Yes, Not right. last yeah. century, yeah. the century, the, eight, you know, the late 1800s, right? And so we're still using the same, I mean, it was just a few years ago, we had a zoology department and they finally changed, kind of reorganized their name to like a more ecology evolution department, right? But we have this like structure, which is from the late 1800s. And, and many of that even goes back further than that, right? To how things were organized at Oxford and Cambridge, right? Yeah. Um, and, but these, all these fields are sort of evolving and all the questions are becoming much more, much more integrated. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not sure exactly sure how that's going to to play out, but um, because it because on 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 one hand the questions are becoming much more complex, but everything else is becoming much more complex. So um, it's hard to be a jack of all trades now, right? Yeah. You, you mentioned yeah. the the you know the the early naturalists, right? Those early naturalists were, they were great botanists. They were great geologists. Yep. They were great astronomers. Observers of right? nature. They were really, yeah. they, in the spare time, they like created new uh, math equations, <laughs> right? right. Um, it's very hard to do that anymore, right? You have to re- you have to be sort of expert on, on relatively narrow, narrow fields increasingly, yep. right? But then the trick be is able to bringing speak all to these, the other ones, yeah, and being able to speak everything. So I think um, I think we have a lot of ways to go of kind of reimagining how best to do that, right? And mm-hmm. and how you know is there going to be an ecology, you know, uh, ecology or horticulture department, right? Mm-hmm. In in twenty years from now or thirty years from now. Or is it going to be a, a, a vegetation stabilization department or something like right. that or mm-hmm. whatever? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting how, how we think about the skills that we were trained with, the skills that students are currently being trained with. You know, all of those were completely different. Not, well, not completely different, but, but uh, at least in a lot of the, the very specific tangible aspects were quite different from what our professors were trained in, right? I mean, they're still critical thinking and and ecology in you know natural history but but you know nobody back then could work a, a stats program nobody back then could do gis nobody could um had an, had access or very few had access to satellite imagery or something of that nature mm-hmm. um so yeah it is it's an interesting one it's a good one well i think it's so, a good, you know, yeah no good what what you you won I think one approach which is emerging is sort of automating some of these things. Like mm-hmm. you mentioned the GIS stuff and like the, the big, the big data where there's a, that integration is done, is done kind of, kind of in the background, right. Or it's, mm-hmm. you know, there's a category, which is we're going to create some system that makes this data or the processes or how to use it more accessible to people who aren't the experts in each of those, each of those areas, which allow yeah. people easier to integrate them. So that is like another whole category, which we're already seeing of like, like, it, you know, being able to talk with programmers, being able to talk with data scientists and how you integrate, how you take, uh, you know, um, interview data. You've talked to local people in a region about how they use natural resources and you figure it out sort of their approaches to, to mm-hmm. managing natural resources or what mm-hmm. they call the names of species, the uses mm-hmm. of species, how you transfer that information so that someone can pull it up online thousands of miles away and integrate it with um, genomics data to answer some interesting, cool question, right? Yep. It's sort of those sorts of tools, which are, I think is one way that this integration is going to be happening in kind of bizarre, weird ways, at least bizarre to our 
old old months That's older good. months <laughs> there'll be some e-dna e in there there'll be some nanites in there there'll be some kind of uh yeah all kinds of cool stuff that's great oh i love it okay it's great so that was um so it's great so we can uh we can continue the conversation with more people now but that's that thank you john lambrinos from oregon state university and an expert on so many things from from uh mutant mu mutinous pacific uh captains to uh to the future of ecology that's great a rent you are a renaissance man dr lambrino <laughs> true renaissance man <laughs> right, stuck in the renaissance <laughs> you know you're, you're an old white dude so it's probably <laughs> fine to be stuck in the i've never been to a renaissance fair though so i have right, that so going for me <laughs> they're hurting you, you must have heard this I, i've heard this story about five times in the last three months but so everybody's hurting for turkey now we're coming up on thanksgiving and uh uh, uh, so everybody's saying that people aren't going to be traveling, have these big family Thanksgiving. So there's people aren't going to be buying as many turkeys. So the turkey industry is hurting. And one of the biggest things they always say is there weren't Renaissance pleasure fairs in the last six months, which apparently is the main market for the giant turkey legs. <laughs> and so with a combination of no Renaissance fairs and smaller family gatherings, our, our turkey industry is hurting in, or getting ready to be hurting a lot, uh, this particular season in this time of COVID. So there's probably, I like, I like Turkey. I, well, I always want to eat it, but it's like, it's, I don't see it often like outside of Thanksgiving. It's true. It's true. It's true. The floor is open to whoever would like to ask a question of the great Dr. Lambrinos. Or, uh, or, or I can ask more questions. Yeah. I mean, I guess I have a question. So John, uh, my name is Nathan. Uh, Sean and I have worked together quite a bit. So I wanted to know, how did you start off in this like, like career path, career field? Like, what was the initial like spark? Ooh, um, there's probably multiple sparks, but I guess the one I'm, <laughs> the earliest one maybe is, um, so I was sort of a latchkey, I was a latchkey um, kid. And uh, so I'd get home, uh, like at three after school and I would go walk around my neighborhood and there was this, it wasn't a park then it was a, it was a stretch of land that they had, they were going to build a freeway on and they hadn't gotten around to, to do it. So it was this sort of fairly long narrow stretch of um, deciduous hardwood forest. And so I would, I would go in there sort of quasi illegally and there was a stream that ran through it. Excellent. And Excellent. I would sort of imagine, imagine myself as a naturalist explorer. It was kind of funny because it's the situation forest, right? So it's, you could get, you walk in a few steps and you don't see anything. You don't see that there's houses, you know, 50 meters that way there's houses and 50 meters that way there's houses. But you could imagine yourself like being in this, in this jungle. And so I would, I would, I learned all the plants and I just would, I would just hang out there. I was kind of a loner. So I would just hang out there, kind of like a weirdo in the forest. <laughs> like I would discover like weird artifacts and that, you know, I'd convince myself that I was, I'd gotten lost. <laughs> and I would, I would never get home. Um, <laughs> one time I even, <laughs> I made, I got into like uh, hand craft wood making and I cut down, <laughs> I also illegally cut down a tree. <laughs> and use it to make a make a tree so I think that might I think that was kind of where I initially got into the idea that because I wasn't really um my you know I grew up in suburban Maryland and so I, we didn't and my family wasn't really like outdoors people or anything and so that was like the first kind of ex oh oh John just froze Oh, we're right on the cusp of him telling us how much he loves Cal Ripken, probably. <laughs> John Boy, you back? Oh my God, the bad internet. Oh, you, you you disappeared. You were just saying you're on the cusp of, and then you froze, dude. So pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was very, very exciting. It was very exciting. Everybody's on the edge of it. The... No, I think that was just where, that was my my first kind of experience with like, wandering around the natural natural world and it's sort of ironic that it was it was you know something that most people probably wouldn't think of as being yeah uh 
nature on a on a on an aside to that. This is getting off <laughs> this question, but a aside to it. So they finally gave up on the idea of this place being turned into a freeway, and they turned it into a a park named after Matthew Henson, who huh. I don't know if you know Matthew Henson. He was a Arctic explorer, and he was on the Perry expedition. He's African American. He's a native son of Maryland, and he's probably may have been the first person to actually get to get to the North Pole, but um, mostly because he was black, he was he didn't get the credit for it. There's also the complication that it's sort of it, it, it's kind of unclear when exactly everyone got to the North Pole. <laughs> so <laughs> so there's that fuzziness too, um, but definitely sort of the racism and, of the time kind of played into it. So anyway, this park is named after Matthew Henson, and I was looking. I haven't been there since, but I was looking online, and there's like it's like a paved path now, and there's like emergency telephones. It's like a very different. It's a very different place now. And, when I was wandering around when I was a youngster. Was he from Maryland? Was he from the area? Why did they name the park after? Yeah, him? so he was, I think he was born in Maryland, hmm. I think. And he spent, I don't know when, at some point he, I think he went to New York or someplace, but he was, I think he was born in Maryland and lived his early life in Maryland. So when I was young, the, near my, well, when I was middle aged, when I was middle school aged, we, we also, we were surrounded by orchards and things. So the same thing as John, it wasn't like, you know, miles and miles, but it was definitely little pockets you could go explore. And now all those are gone. Now all those are, where I grew up are now all houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. Don Rodriguez looks like he has a question. Well, uh, yeah, when we were talking about skill sets for students, um, and you're talking about, hi, John, how you been? Hey, John. <laughs> uh, talking about uh, uh, introduced species and, and whatnot, I think it's important to think about a land use as part of that whole equation and this um, public versus private land and the future of resource management, I'm beginning to think, uh, is going to involve private landowners a lot more going forward. And so communication skills and, and how, how, to, how to engage people effectively around some of these issues that they may not be, they may not be burning about ecosystems and, and, and whatnot, but convincing them that, you know, this is the right way forward might be a really important skill set with students. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And one one sort of one example of that is sort of climate corridors, right? Creating climate corridors. And I was reading a uh, uh, a paper recently. I'm gonna forget the actual statistics from the paper, but they basically they assessed where the current uh, protected areas are, and then they and then they had some various models to try and establish where good climate quarter quarters would be. And it was something like 80% of the land of these proposed climate quarters were was private land, basically. Wow. It was currently private yeah. land. And so to it, it's gonna involve um, as you said, sort of engaging engaging people. We may about be thinking about, you know, I'm going to create a climate quarter on my land. And it also may involve sort of Kind of reevaluating what we consider protected areas, right, and how they look and how they, and how they function, right? Um, yeah, so I agree. It's that's another really. It's going to get more sort of integrated in terms of how that interaction with people, right, and how we talk with people and communicate with people, and yeah. I think those soft skills are really key. I think sometimes we give short, or at least our society or our disciplines give short shrift to the the human dimensions and the social aspects of that stuff, but that's so incredibly key. If you don't have an inroad to, for in this case, if you don't have an inroad into that homeowner or that homeowner's kids or that homeowner's family, we're screwed, right? But if we have inroads, if there's trust, if they see see a way to have dialogue with the folks seeking the, the protected area status or the management issue, then there's a shot. We have a shot that we can convince them to, you know, allow 
species X to go over their land or not. But if we're just sort of jerky and, and institutional and say, screw you, we're the smart people, we've, we've, we've blown that opportunity to engage those folks. It's, I think, um, I think there's a lot of, you know, this, particularly right after the election and the last, the last several years in our country, it seemed like this, there's been this increasing schism, right? Where just people just don't understand each other mm -hmm. at all. But I think there's still, a, that schism is not really calcified yet. There is still, like, uh, I, I, I've wor I work with lots of farmers or I've visited with farmers and there's things like you, you go and talk to some farmer and if you ask if you I know if I know if you ask this farmer something about politics right or something about taxes or something about um, uh, the government in some way right uh, that you would get one response you talk to them about their land they sound like like um, like super ecologists, super conservationists, yeah. right? And you ask them, oh, oh, this, like, this is this would be great. Like you could get the um, USDA will give you money to do right. this conservation work you're doing. US, no, I'm never going to get money from the USDA, right? <laughs> right. Um, so I think there's, um, I think in large degrees, this this apparent schism. There's ways of breaking that down. It's not. It's not like we're we're on this inevitable trajectory where we're just going to get farther and farther apart from each other. Totally, I, I completely agree. One of the one of the boards I sit on, the Resource Conservation District, um, is exactly what John's talking about. It's 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 created for. It, it basically is to facilitate conservation of ag land in Ventura County. Some research conservation districts in California are designed specifically to conserve what we might call traditional like protected areas, biodiversity and stuff. But ours is absolutely a traditional one focused on agriculture. But in the last couple of years, we've really transitioned to focus on, you know, we have projects doing um, uh, uh, water efficiency, uh, or providing services about measuring how efficient water use is on farms. Uh, uh, carbon sequestration, invasive species management, all these things that we don't necessarily associate with the, with the ag community, but, but all with the almost exclusive exception of me, the other board members and the directors are, are full-time ag folks. They're, they're, they're running you know, very large avocado orchards, very large citrus orchards, whatever. And we've just been having a discussion about moving into the urban area and and, and servicing not just the ag folks, but, but the urban community. And these are folks that I think John's right. If I, we, if I asked her who they voted for or something, I think, I, I think maybe they and, and, and I had voted for different, uh, uh, different uh, people, um, but totally in agreement that, hey, this is, this is a unifying thing. We're all in agreement and there is no animosity. There is no distrust. There is no ill, Ill will. And I think, I think you know, it, so much of it is about reframing the question and not buying into the silliness that we read about in the papers about how we're all totally stupid and, and hate each other. It's, it, you know, define, define the, the challenge as you want to define it. And a lot of times it's much less problematic. Mm -hmm. We just had an interesting situation here in Colorado where the voters voted to reintroduce gray wolves mm. into the state. Awesome. <laughs> and, uh, it was it was clearly a rural urban yeah, yeah. Uh, divide on this issue in the state and uh, and first time uh, a wildlife management decision has been made by the voting public in Colorado. Although we did do a we did do a bear baiting uh, <laughs> issue back in '92 where it outlawed bear baiting, uh, even though the Division of Wildlife was. Really? Oh, I thought you were going to say you, you voted to bait bears. I no, 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 no. Actually, it was just the opposite. And that was the, that was kind of the <clears throat> bellwether event for the Colorado Division of Wildlife, knowing that they needed human dimensions <laughs> uh, information, <laughs> given that the public is, is uh, actively engaged around particularly charismatic megafauna, right? And they're going to, 
they're going to push these issues uh, over and over again. Yep. <laughs> I have all kinds of questions, but other people have questions. Other people have comments or, or things they're wondering about. I am kind of curious, just uh, if, I don't know, I know that you don't live around here, but you have connections in this area, John, like, do you have thoughts on what the Oxnard plan will look like in the next 20 years with sort of different idea? I mean, we have SOAR, that's what it's called, right? <laughs> um, which is supposed to um, save our agricultural resources at the same time that we, now we have sort of back and forth legislation on whether we should grow cannabis here. Oregon has some interesting drug growth things happening um but sort of you know everything is legal in oregon after <laughs> I, think, I think but i guess what is it you know what do things look like as i mean especially now that we're seeing some parts of the economy stalled um with the pandemic but i don't know I, i'm kind of curious you know the these we talk you both talk about these orchards and things that have disappeared like is that what it's going to be like for the people of this generation are we just going to shift gears and you know let go of that legacy that's been so much a part of this area? No, that's a good, that's a good question. And the, you know, the Oxnard Plain is a, it's probably the, this is the poster child, it's probably a cliche to say, of the urban, this urban agriculture conflict it's amazing to <laughs> to to it's a very bizarre place in many ways right it's very intensified industrialized agriculture surrounded by in, in, in a megalopolis of people basically right um and yeah so it's interesting to to think about you know, what what the future of that is going going to be um you know, I think there's models. So like Europe is a model, right? Where they, at some point, they made a sort of conscious effort that we, that agriculture is not simply kind of a, a thing that produces economic wealth and, and produces commodities, right? But it was also a cultural thing. And it was a very important part of their, of their culture. And so they, and they've enshrined in part of their laws in, to preserve that cultural aspect of it. It's not been completely, it's not been completely, um, you know, it hasn't kept European agriculture like it was in 1700, um, but more so than, um, you know, far average farm size is, is way smaller in, in Europe than it is Europe than it is in North America, for instance. Um, so I think that's sort of a model where, you know, it became that those values, right, became not only sort of values that were sort of culturally kind of relevant, but also got enshrined in legislation and politically that we need to have farms. We want to we want to have farms that have these particular characteristics. We want to be able to live next to farms, those sorts of things. And of course, I think the agriculture is going through a lot of flux for a whole variety of of reasons and things like on one end, um, more urban agriculture, right? So on one hand, you have things like this, this sort of model where you have industrialized agriculture in the Oxnard Plain, right up butting against cities. But then you also have people, you know, in New Orleans, right? Having, growing their own food in small little pots in New Orleans. So I think there's a lot of agriculture is, is changing too for a whole lot of forces. So yeah, it's, it's a good question how it's going to look 30 we have, years. We have a student years. that's working on, uh, as a farm, cultivating mushrooms in downtown Los Angeles, like in, in pure, like hardcore urban areas. And then the, I, the trend that I've seen, and I don't know if you've seen this up in Oregon, but the trend that we're having here on the Oxnard Plain is more and more, I don't know what the term would be. It's not exactly urban, but it's, um, it's more in intensify i don't know if that's the term but so more hoop houses more very intense greenhouses such as howlings where they they grow most of the tomatoes for uh, costco um mm -hmm. hyper hyper efficient in water you know fantastic energy efficiency etc but um but 
you know, great company doing great stuff, but the tomatoes taste like crap because they're, 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 you know, generic tomatoes, but they produce a lot of tomatoes. Um, but it's very much, it's, it's almost like a biotech pr production of agriculture. It's not, it's not, you know, it, it's closed, closed buildings and stuff. And they have all these wonderful things in the, getting us back to the invasives that they use these non-native bees to do the pollinate. It's hydroponics. So they do the, 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 the pollination of the tomato plants happens from these non-native bees, much larger bombus, a, 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 a bumblebee as opposed to more like a, a honeybee type of type of bee. Um, and they say, this is great. And they've made these, the, the hive, I guess is the term, but the hive where the, where the queens are such that the queens can never get out. But we've had students that have found their, their bees all out in the wild, but that's enough. That, so, so the, the, the individuals are dispersing out, but, but it's a very much, you know, economically very profitable, but a very different view of agriculture than we're, we're traditionally used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, um, we have, uh, it sort of brings in the hemp too. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, pot growing on here, around here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stinky, stinky, skunky, skunky. I have and everyone got mad about it at school. I'm sorry. Go, 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 sorry, Patrice, you can say something. Um, I was just gonna ask, cause y'all y'all brought up the fact that there's a bunch that you didn't get to learn in school, mm. and now we're learning those things. Has it? Have you noticed like a divide in how like the general public sees things because of that? Like, is it? There's like a lot of varying opinions on things, and like. You know, not all of us agree on how to take care of stuff. Mm -hmm. So have you seen that happen? Like, worse? <laughs> mm. John? <laughs> yeah, yes, <Yeah>, speaker. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. This is probably, I don't think this is really answering your, your question. Um, but, you know, I think the real big change for me has been kind of related to the internet and kind of the related to just the diversity of ways that people can get information from the variety of different sources. So I'm going to sound really old, but when I was growing up, right, there were th like three, if you were lucky, four TV stations, right? And the news came on at seven o'clock and everyone sat down and listen to four white guys tell them what was up with the world, right? And they had a lot of like influence and in, in power. So like when Walter Cronkite, he was, uh, he, did, he did the news for a long time. And uh, when Walter Cronkite said, you know, the, the government's been lying to us about the Vietnam War, right? And the Vietnam War is not going so well, right? People across America from both sides of the political aisle said, oh, wow, Walter Gronkite is telling me this. That is, wow, I think that's probably true. And that was a real kind of shift, right? When someone of that kind of established authority and everyone trusted Walter Cronkite to, to, to tell them honestly what was up and he told them honestly. I don't think that happens anymore, right? Everyone is getting news information from a whole diverse range of sources they can pick and choose. And my source is better than your source, right? And I think, um, I think that's partly fed into why it, all these discussions always seem so combative and no one, no one can come to consensus anymore. I mean, there's, there's, you know, the, there's, there's pluses and minuses to that, right? Back, you know, there's four white guys telling, telling the country, right? What, what to do, right? Um, or, you know, having a big influence on people's opinions, right? So that's probably not exactly the best thing as well. But I think there, there's a kind of downsides to the broader democratization of, of that information as, as well. So I don't think that was really uh, I, answer, I asked, answered your question exactly. But to follow that up, I would say that there's, so John's talking about diversification of, of information sources. And I think that's good. Right, it's better to be able to hear from other groups and stuff. But, but it's very clear, I think, that that when we had the the dot com bubble burst in the late '90s, the response was 
we have to monetize everything. And that's really when the modern era of social media really started. Because when John and I were in school, um, there was all kinds of message boards and there's all kinds of diverse things, but we or you could search them out and you could, you could ask a question, you could sort of dive into it. Now, the, the model is essentially, you are the model, you are the value, right? So your attention is the monetization. It doesn't matter what you're paying attention to, they just, they just want you paying attention. And so, so that, that notion of lots of diverse information sources has been, I, I don't know, the, the corrupted or I don't know what, the, I mean, you, you, you are, you're being played, right? I mean, you are, you are the, the thing being bought and sold by all these companies and your phone tracking you and all that kind of stuff. And that, I think that notion of just capturing your attention as crazy as we can do it, as, as scandalous and as weird and as, as insane, that, that sort of seems to be running the show these days. But I think, but I think in general, I think not just you guys that are ESRM majors, but, but just in general, young folks, you guys, I think, generally get it. You might not know exactly, you might not be an expert on climate change, but you know that there's something messed up with, with the climate system. And I think you, you get that there's something messed up with, with various aspects of, of the natural world, even if you don't know the right, the, the right response to, to respond to it. Whereas I think when I was younger, there was still a lot of people that didn't necessarily, that thought that was very much a hippie thing or that that was very much, that was very much a, a um, you know, a, a, sub, a subsection of society thought that, but not everybody. And I think now there's a much broader understanding of, especially of young, younger generation, that we need to, to tend to the natural world in a different way. I, I think, I don't know, I don't know if you guys, agree. I don't know if you agree, John, do you agree? I don't know. I think oh, one I, thing is that we need more local, the news, local news sources are better at covering this now than the national news sources, like at least for us, like I feel like um, ESRM faculty and you probably up in your area too, like you're talking to the local reporters and saying, well, this is what it means when this, you know, mountain lion gets killed on the freeway or when this fire happens, what's, you know, going on with these species and all these things. And, um, and they're open. The problem is that those news sources are disappearing, especially print media. So I think that's the area because um, I'm finding more uh, nuanced scientific information through the local news sources that are just hungry for people to share that their insights and people like um, our ESRM students as well. So I think the ability to communicate that is something that I think is so powerful. And that's obviously I teach writing, so that's big to me <laughs> too. But I mean, it's, it's going to make such a difference, especially in the next 20 years. So I'm excited that you're getting this kind of education. little bra bra. Wow, that was good. That was good. <laughs> Other questions for the great Jam Dr. John Lambrinos. I just want to point out that John, uh, when I first knew John, always had baseball playing on his computer with Cal Ripken, but also <laughs> always had a full bookshelf. Can you um, name some books that you think are must read books for our I know college students don't have a lot of time for extra reading, but wow, it really literary. makes such a difference. I know because, I mean, the, your cohort was super well read, even though you also had all this other stuff you were doing. So it inspired me. What, it, what, what do you recommend for people that's kind of like, you've got to read this if you like what I like? Ooh. Don't say uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter because I've already said that. So good. <laughs> Oh, I always hate these questions because I can, I, A, I can never think of the, <laughs> no, the no, thousands. Wait, how about this? What's the last book you read? How about that? How, that might be That's easier. hard too. Maybe he's really busy. What was the last book I read? Oh, um, so I've been reading, I got the, let's see if I have it. Um, I've been reading, there's a classic history of Southern California, um, landscaping like like gardens mm. of california um and i'm forgetting her name i think i have it on my <laughs> we're on the move wow it's super virtual reality now oh, yeah, it's cool. called it's called southern california gardens by victoria padilla and it's this it's um it's kind of a history of 
of Southern California Gardens. And it, she starts way off very early. She has all these great photographs of um, um, like gardens in Los Angeles in the mid 1800s. And I, I was looking at them because I, my, my grad students and I, um, we've, we've been writing a, a kind of a history of irrigation in urban landscapes. Right. So a lot of people always talk about irrigation in, um, uh, you know, agriculture and stuff, but not so much about in urban landscapes. So we've been looking at sort of that early history in California, like when did people actually start irrigating their lawn, right, and, or irrigating their um, their gardens. And so I was, I've been looking at sort of these books. Anyway, this is a great, it's a, it's really a great sort of history. It's, I think it's out of print. I got this um used somewhere but it's southern california garden show us the cover john show us the cover no, let's see i gotta like flip my thing here there it is excellent there's some kind of agave or something on there that's cool or century plant or something so it's cool there's um it's so like one of the things we found is so initially the um, uh, very early on, like sort of 18, 1880s, the, uh, they would extend the, the zanjas, right? So which was the irrigation canals that were the original sort of Spanish, um, comes from sort of the, the Spanish irrigation system for the city of Los Angeles. And so there's, there's these pictures of, um, I won't be able to find it, but there's pictures of kind of uh, just just west of downtown, really big fancy houses with with lawns, and they don't have sprinklers yet, but they have. You can see the zanja, which is running this irrigation ditch, which is running, sort of uh, bordering the sidewalk, right? And um, basically, uh, the sanjero would come, and he would open up the the sluice gate for your house, and it would give you give you your allotment of of water. It wasn't until like the 19th century, like early 1800s, and they started replacing the, the sanjas with um, with pipe, and then they they started metering the the water. That was like the 1920s, 19 1930s. Um, so she has some cool sort of pictures of early pictures of those in there too. So I want to follow up with with Catrice's idea, and then link it back to something John just said, which is. Um, one cool thing that that's a super neat idea to do, which picks up on all these ideas we've been talking about, is is change how we've how we've changed our our management of the resources or our perception of the resources or environmental justice or whatever. And so, like John was talking about, like back in the day, there was four old white dudes sort of reading the news. Um, a really interesting way is for you guys, for you youngins, to actually track that, to track how that change has happened. And there's tremendous resource. So we think about back in the day when things maybe were, were less equitable and, and more corporate and all, all those kinds of things. One way is to say, oh, that, you know, that maybe that sucked compared to our point of view. But the other way to think about it, that is, that is one condition. What is our condition now? And there's a great amount of scholarship. So John's talking about irrigation, how irrigation was versus how irrigation is now. And there's all kinds of cool projects you guys could do that is super low hanging fruit. People have not done, right? So, so how families farm different, how families planted different crops in their front yards because they were from Mexico and they weren't like the, their neighbors and you know, all that cool stuff. And one example of, of cool things you can do is uh, we've been talking, John's working on a paper of using old television shows, 1970s television shows that you know you think and now we think you know quick cut you guys are all you youngins are so quick 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 quick. but back in the day if you watch columbo some of us old people like columbo it would take about like 17 minutes to do one scene and in the process of columbo the detective walking over the bluff there was about you know a minute and a half shot of the malibu bluff cliffs and you could see what the vegetation was and so you can actually do scholarship on old movies, old television of the landscapes back in the day versus now. And that's kind of cool. Do you want to say anything about that, John Boy? Uh, no, it's, but it's, I, I watch Chips. I watch Columbo too. But I watch, I've been watching um, Chips, like the old, the old Chips episodes with Ponch and John. 
and they filmed um they just have like lots of great scene scenery shots of southern california in in the late in the late 70s and they filmed a lot of it was in along the coast so there's a in malibu they they actually had a a whole storyline involving pot growers in Topanga Canyon. And it was the whole thing is shot on location in, in Topanga. And I don't know, how, they must have been making a lot of money because it was all <laughs> on location, all outside, basically, or the whole show is like outside, basically, on location. And they're always like crashing cars. <laughs> There's always great shots of like, I'm sure they couldn't get a permit for this but like the car going over the cliff and down and the explosions the, ripping out explosions. ripping out huge chunks of chaparral and an explosion <laughs> in the chaparral <laughs> yeah oh so there's God. uh it's just sort of great um kind of to see sort of what these landscapes looked like and you can even just casually watching them on television you can mm -hmm. see you can see changes. You can see the pollution's a lot worse. <laughs> yeah, I have to just remind myself that even though I long for the landscape, like my throat hurt all the time growing up here in that decade. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't see, like you'd be at my, you know, family's houses and like you couldn't see beyond their yard. <laughs> yeah. Even if they were up on a vista, it's like, oh. I, I always remember the, the, the second reboot of Battlestar Galactica when they actually get to Earth and they send the the you know the visitors come down they're like oh my god there's is a shot in like 1980 or 82 or something and they, they go to los angeles and they say, oh my god they got a force field they have a force field over los angeles and it was just a smog mm. and so they saw the smog and they thought it was some kind of like <laughs> space energy field or something like that so awesome well i'll give you guys if there's any burning questions i'll give you guys one last opportunity to ask the great dr lambrinos if anything is on the tip of your tongue that you want to ask I kind of had one question that yeah. like I didn't really know how, the best way to phrase it but I guess like so at my school there's like not necessarily a ton of like open-mindedness to like facts <laughs> I guess I'd say sometimes and uh, I like for example I had this environmental my the one environmental science teacher at my school last year constantly the entire year was feeding my class things like oh yeah you know the polar ice caps are melting, but it's not really as bad. And she pulls up like a satellite image and she's like, yeah, this isn't that accurate. It's, it's a little over-exaggerated, even though it was under-exaggerated because it was from like 2001. And like <laughs> just a ton of different little things like that throughout the year. And like, and saying things like, oh yeah, we have, like she lives next to some old Rocketdyne like waste site that's like spewing radiation. And she lives next to it with a bunch of farm animals. And she's like, yeah, no, I think it's safe. That, like, I, I don't think there's anything I have to be afraid of. Like, my life is, I've, my life spans not getting shortened or anything. And like, I never really knew in the moment. Also, because she was the one grading all my tests and stuff. But like, how would you sort of not necessarily combat that? But like, I was, I was trying to figure out, and I kind of never really succeeded in like conveying to other people in the class that like that wasn't the way things were. But I could only like talk to like the people I really knew. And everyone else was just sort of like buying what the teacher was saying. Propaganda. You're talking about anti-environmental propaganda, Gabriel. Ooh, yeah. that's a difficult one. Because, well, partly because it's like the power dynamics, right? You're, <laughs> yeah. there's the teacher and you're the student, right? So how are you going to go, yo, you're, that's bullshit, <laughs> yeah. right? Without coming across as being like a unruly student um and then the other thing is my first like like is like how like i'm not one of those people who you know i'm not, not i'm not like the the social network node so i'm not sure how people like you know everyone you become the person who everyone actually listens to and and believes their information and how like i'm so not actually sure how you, you, have a beard. you, have how you do it very trustworthy <laughs> on your face Sorry. so but i think you know and more more generally when um when talking with with people like if you know, i'm going out and talking to to farmers is i think there's always some sort of common common ground that you sort of first have to establish this relationship where you 
you become uh you become not just you become a person to them basically right you become and that may be so you may be talking about something else right and then once you sort of establish that relationship with that that person right then you can you can then start to sort of question some of the things they've said about climate change well you know you know you say this and i you know i can see that point of view but you know here's this here's why that is not that interpretation of that information is maybe not right here's some other interpretations but i think it, it's hard to just go in there right right off the bat and say you know i think you sort of it, it really involves kind of building some trust is kind of one kind of jargony thing way of saying it is you know when i go talk to a farmer there's lots of things i can talk about farmers that don't involve climate change right and and there's ways and then but and so building that sort of they respect me for for knowing about their farming systems right and knowing knowing the the issues that they're facing right and then and then i can talk to them about climate change and sometimes it involves like not using words like climate change right and using a common a common metric like you know the the weather the weather's been really squirrely the last 10 years right and that's really that's really screwed up your finances right and so now we got what are some ways you can think about miti like mitigating this squirrely weather which is happening Right. So now you're talking about climate change, mitigating climate change, but you're not you're, you're using a different kind of lexicon to do that. So there's things like that, I think, work how you do that in, in your <laughs> in your class when you have a nutty teacher. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But that's good. I, I like that. I like that notion of uh, yeah, you can't question the authority because they'll fail you or whatever, but you can sort of you can sort of build trust and then say, well, that's funny because this one from 20 years later shows this. That's, that's interesting you would show that one, that kind of thing. All right, excellent questions, you guys. Great, let's, let's thank the great, every unmute and give Dr. Lambrinos a little bit of a, a little bit of round of applause here. Very nice, very nice. Thanks guys, I'm very, I'm very honored to be part of the inaugural Dewdrop. The Dewdrop. Dewdrop in West. It's great. Now you can join in future do drops, John. I'm just saying you are more than welcome. So, um, so awesome. So thanks you guys. This was great. Thanks to John. Thanks to everybody. And uh, let me know if you guys have feedback for how I can, how we can evolve this and make this more dynamic and collaborative. But um, thanks for joining everyone a little bit long on our, on our inaugural one. I was trying to keep it at just an hour, but John is so engaging. It's how can you, how can you stop? How can you stop the beard? You can't stop the beard. So um, anyway, so thanks for showing up, everybody. Have a great evening. We're gonna I'm gonna shut this down, and this will soon be up online. So if your friends didn't get to had class or something, they couldn't join in. Folks can watch it after the fact. Thanks, everybody. See you thanks, soon. Man. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. See you Dan.